I, this is put together this morning, um, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And my name is Bill Degman, and um, I'm uh, uh, Vice President of the Mid-Atlantic Retrocomputing Hobbyists, along with Andy. Um, I want to thank everybody that helped make this possible. And um, I just wanted to just talk a little bit, especially for those people who are not from this area, a little bit about the parallels and some of the things that I've learned, not having actually been there and done it myself because I was too young, the things that I've learned about through research. And um, I also teach a class at the University of Delaware about computer history um, that I've learned specific to this area that you might find interesting. And it's mostly having to do with the homebrew spirit. Okay, I start, I start off with uh, Claude. Is Claude here? He's in the back. He's in the back? Um, with, with the resistors, which is a group that was founded around, some people say 65, some people say 1966, um, with, the, uh, with the idea of bringing computers to students. Now, those of you that are familiar with computer history know about California's uh, People's Computer Company and, um, and, and the, um, uh, the Homebrew Computer Club. But in a lot of ways, this spirit um, was also in parallel occurring in this area um, and in um, Hopewell, New Jersey specifically, there was a large barn, and I, if I understand correctly, it's not per se a, a, you know, a cattle barn, it's a large building. I had a theater on the upstairs, but the purpose of this was to get students and to bring um, computers to the people in the same way that uh, was being done a few years later in California. For example, Project Might, which maybe a lot of you know about, um, brought technology to underprivileged persons, uh, African Americans and other groups who didn't have access or use or educational opportunities about computers, uh, but the resistors was part of that whole movement to making computers personal because the idea is um, uh, that if you bring computers to people and they can use the computers, um, it's not only going to be in control of IBM and large corporations and, and uh, the military and whatnot. The, um, the Radio Electronics Magazine, uh, Mark 8, in a lot of ways, launched what was already a, a consolidating movement. And, and this, of course, um, you, would, you would send away for this kit in 1974. Um, Jonathan Titus developed, and in Radio City uh, Station, New York City, is where you would actually send away for the kit instructions so that you could build your own computer. This is in New York City. This is something also happening in the East Coast. So just, essentially, the theme here is, as I'm pointing out, yes, question. John Titus is still around. Yes. He lives in the town adjacent to mine. I have to be able to get in touch with him. But he is now a, um, an editor. Yeah, Evan, Evan used to work for him yeah. for a while. So he's, uh, he's still in there. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's definitely something that was uh, not out in the West Coast. Not that I'm against the West Coast, of course. Uh, another another uh, important group was the Amateur Computer uh, Group of New Jersey, still in existence, founded by Soul Libs, who I believe has done, uh, spoke at um, 2006 or 2007. But he is still um, involved in uh, uh, the group based, based in Scotch Plains, community workshop involvement. Again, this concept of um, at the time, forming a group that would take like-minded engineers. We're not talking about people who want to learn how to use Excel. We're talking about engineers who wanted to use computer, who wanted to build a computer, who also wanted to just build computing devices, uh, calculating uh, things that would make jobs easier, make uh, like ham radio and so forth easier. It wasn't like people in 1975 um, were necessarily. Uh, getting together and saying, let's build a computer and an operating system and we're going to put a word processor on it. This was before all that. But there were groups of like-minded persons getting together to help bootstrap each other and, and, and teach each other those little pieces that would get a little farther and a little farther. Maybe one person would have a Mark 8 kit and would want to show others who may have um, uh, just gotten started with the product to actually put things together. So again, very important group. Uh, in New Jersey starting in 1975. Of course, the Altair uh, was, a, was another uh, impetus to things like this. 1975, uh, computer stores uh, started popping up in this part of the country, and two that I know of um, in this, uh, within a few hundred mile radius were uh, Larry Stein's Computer Mart um, in Woodbridge Township and uh, Robert Radcliffe's Hoboken Computer uh, Works uh, 
um, in Hoboken. And I understand that Larry uh, actually went public by 1986 with this and um, made a lot of money. And so that's just to, to give you some background that it was parallel to the bites and the other things going on in California. These were some of the, uh, the big names in uh, the mid-70s. I, I, this next, this next uh, slide is an illustration not of um, the, the Southern California Computing Society's interface uh, per se, but to illustrate the point that a lot of people might not know that um, in creative computing, you might, uh, it's kind of ironic, but, but this quote that I found um, from uh, David All. I think that you want to know where the most important areas in the country for members of microcomputer activities. I'd say Philadelphia. It's not California. It's Philadelphia. So in September, October of 1976, the largest outside of Southern California group of the SCCS was in this area. And specifically, um, it helped to launch the, uh, the Philadelphia Area Computer Society and some other places. But it's just very interesting that uh, that there was so much enthusiasm for computing. You've got some, you know, you've got an outgrowth of of of, of a group that was in Southern California. Which, if you go deeper into this story, in some ways this group was kind of different than the Homebrew Computing Club. This would have been more of the corporate. This was definitely more of the looking bigger picture group from the Southern California area. Um, and it's interesting that they're the ones that that um, probably did the outreach to and met with those people in New Jersey had similar thoughts. But this is, there's definitely a connection. This is the oldest ad that I could find for the uh, New Jersey Computer Festival, and it's from Dr. Dobbs' journal in March 1976. Um, the, uh, the persons who were responsible for this, uh, Dr. Alan Katz and um, Soul Lives, couldn't afford or, and or didn't pay for an April um, advertisement that I could see in Dr. Dobbs, but this is the, the, uh, the advertisement that appeared in Dr. Dobbs' journal for the New Jersey Computer Festival, which to date is the longest um, running computer show of its kind. So you, so you can see May 2nd. And here's another slide for the Trenton Computer Festival. You can see uh, May 2nd, uh, so it was only a one-day event. Um, there, are, there is some controversy about who exactly founded it, and I don't like to ever say the first or founded or whatnot, but according to uh, sources, the first manufacturer independent computer convention of national scope for computer hobbyists was on May 2nd, 1976. There were only 45 exhibitors, but you had MITS, IMSI, Processor Tech, um, Ohio Scientific, SWTPC, Chromemco, uh, the digital group and so forth uh, at in attendance. So this was this was definitely uh, a national uh, uh, convention. Uh, and so and by looking at those names, you can see a number of them came from California, probably for the first time to a show in uh, the East Coast. Attendance of 1500, and also this ushered in the beginnings of the outdoor flea market, which is still popular today, a uh, ham fest for computers and components. That's what they were calling it. So. The reason that you, you see these kinds of things, and unfortunately I don't have enough time to talk about it, is that at the time, um, people weren't going there to buy a computer per se. They were, buying, they were going there because they could only afford what they could afford. And so they were looking for parts and pieces and old teletypes and whatever they could find. And that's what made the, 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 uh, the indoor area of the actual vendors for the dream machine that you would love to own that you maybe could afford to get the, the bare component computer system, then you would go to the ham fest to find a teletype or the wires or the component tree and whatever so that you could actually go to your club somewhere and work with your team of engineers to actually build a working computer system, which at the time, of course, might only have 4K in it. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a different spirit than, than you would have today. And it's an important thing that I want, I want to illustrate that this was happening in Trenton, not just in California. <coughs> Um, and I'm sure it was happening in many other parts of the world, other country as well. The Philadelphia Area Computer Society started right after uh, the uh, Trenton uh, Computer Fair. Um, there were probably, the persons were probably from, like Dick Moberg and whatnot, were probably at the Trenton. They probably rushed right home and immediately started the Philadelphia Area Group. Me, I, I don't think the first festivals were in Trenton. In fact, uh, one of the first ones was in, in Atlantic City. Now that comes up another two months, but 
But good point. You're helping me on the next slide. Um, so the Philadelphia Area Computer Society. So now we've got we've got the South Jersey group. We've got the Philadelphia Area group. Um, first, PACS members were generally engineers and ham radio operators, similar to the uh, the uh, New Jersey group. Uh, maybe even more so, uh, less education oriented. Uh, engineers using microprocessors not as a computer but as a simple electronic controller, replacing dozens of discrete components. There were no special interest groups, which I'll explain later. Just one main meeting centered around building a computer and sharing hardware. Yesterday, when I did the demonstration of the um, the Altair playing uh, the music on the radio, that would have been the, the kind of uh, scene that you would have had where you had one person in the front um, getting their Altair ready and everybody would be there. And it would be very exciting for them because maybe only three or four of them would actually have had a working computer and the rest were just seeing what you could potentially do with it. It was a, it was a time for inspiration. It was a time for imagination and um, uh, sharing of ideas together, not so much as special interest groups. This is just an example of a system's capabilities from 1976. The reason that I put this and not the 75 uh, Altair is that that had already been put out. This is the kind of thing that would have been on the show floor at the Trenton Computer Fair in 1976 in the early uh, summer, spring. See the capabilities, uh, uh, 2 megahertz, um, 8 data bits, and so forth. This, this actual computer is in the, um, in the exhibit room, if you want to take a look at it. Okay, then the PC-76. You can see this is the advertisement for that. Very similar. Um, this was the first Mid-Atlantic trade show. Slightly different, you know, and again, I don't like using first. So this was a trade show that had a lot of first things occurring in it. I believe um, Apple was at this. I believe uh, a number of other persons that I've spoken with told me, um, that, you know, that the, 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 your classic vendors were there, processor technologies and MITS and whatnot. There's the actual advertisement. And there's a large-sized version of this ad in our computer museum, as are these computers. But these are the kind of things you would have bought if you were there and not been able to afford. Um, Here's an interesting uh, slide. This is a computer that I'm sure a lot of you in this room have never heard of before, although if you have, I'd love to hear more about it. But this is an example of the kind of training and, and teaching and, and uh, computer systems that were being built by these homebrew clubs in our area. This one's specific to the Philadelphia Area Computer Society. It's called the Daytac 1000. And this actually appeared in Byte Magazine of July 1977, although it was built earlier. This is just an example of a trainer. This is the kind of thing that a contributor, in this case, um, Carmen DiCamillo and, and, and Roland James, built a company around it after they built this. But what they did is they, they, they built a homebrew system, and then they kind of consolidated it, made a kit, you know, assembled the parts, so that persons that were interested in making their own computer would have a head start. And this is the kind of thing that was coming out of the Philadelphia area. 6502 was the processor. And Moss Technologies, which was based in Norristown, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, which is near Philadelphia, is kind of our, our home team uh, company in the early homebrew computing days. The 6502 processor, uh, we're all familiar with that here in this group. Um, there's a gentleman named Will Matthews who was from Moss who would go to clubs like the Philadelphia Air Computer Society and I'm sure uh, other groups to provide chips that maybe weren't perfect but were the kind of thing that would give uh, persons like the Daytech group and other groups a chip that they could kind of build a computer around. That would have been a very exciting thing um, to get an actual microprocessor and were persons like this that were making it possible and knowing the, the value of these groups and providing uh, these, uh, these parts at a lower rate, knowing that these were the people who were going to find ways to use this stuff and then it was going to help make an industry that Moss was going to profit from. So it was definitely a symbiotic kind of a thing. So as we, got, as we emerge into 1977, as we know here, the, the homebrew clubs began to splinter into specialty groups. At first around processors, 6800, uh, the 6502, the 8080, 8008 was still popular in 1977. And then, there, then the application specialty groups emerged at this time. Um, PACs or, and other groups uh, began uh, official involvement in the uh, Trenton Computer Festival. Uh, along with the IEEE Society in Princeton, uh, 1977. So you're starting to see a more of a, within a year, 
PACs was starting to merge uh, with the uh, Calif uh, with the um, with the New Jersey, and it was starting to have enough of its own momentum where it was probably the uh, Southern California Computer Society was probably having less of an influence, less of an involvement. It wasn't necessary anymore. Uh, in 1977, uh, although you have your appliance computers like the TRS-80 Model 1, the Commodore PET, um, you also would still have persons at this time using teletypes and cassette in, 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 uh, because they wouldn't have been able to afford the computer systems. So definitely teletype and cassette were definitely the most popular storage in 1977. And you also saw the emergence of uh, S100 improvements such as uh, uh, North Star's DOS and the CPM operating system. So we're starting to get out of the, uh, well, I'll get to this one, out of the pure homebrew engineers and you were starting to add persons to the, uh, to the world of computing and the expectations of what a computer could do were starting to emerge. I am from Delaware, and I bet you there's, is there anybody here from Delaware? For whatever reason, yeah. Delaware, like, pretended nothing was going on, I suppose. But I, I wanted to at least state for the state, if I, if I must, that there was a computer company. After extraneous research, I found that in Newark, Delaware, probably at the University of Delaware, the Versatile II by Computer Data Systems was made available in 1977. It was an S100 system. And it was a, it was a all-in-one type system when you would purchase it, you put it on the table and turn it on. It would have everything that you needed to um, to you know use the computer right away. Uh, Project Delta out of the University of Delaware um, was similar to resistors in that it was providing uh, PDP computing um, opportunities to students, and that was based out of Delaware. Plato was a very popular uh, computer system predating bulletin boards that was very popular at the University of Delaware. And of course, I used to work at IBM in my very early days, before this, but, and I remember when I worked at DuPont also, as I kind of bounced around as a consultant in my, my earliest days, IBM would pull the 18-wheeler the up, open it up, and DuPont would just take whatever was in there and just put it on everybody's desk. And that was, in a lot of ways, what was going on in Delaware at the time. It wasn't the homebrewing wasn't really happening so much, but it was... The money that was involved with DuPont and ICI and all the banks, because Delaware is a corporate center where the early adoption of computing um, was happening in the um, in the corporate world, you would have seen computers on desks earlier in, in a Delaware office than many other parts of the country. And what this eventually led to was the depreciation of these assets and then them showing up for sale in flea markets and whatnot in Delaware, and, and uh, to this day, that one of the best flea markets in, Del in, in the country is in Delaware, in Newcastle County, and that you can still, if you dig with a shovel, you'll still find IBM PCs, you know, just basically in the dirt that you can pull out, turn on, and start up again. But that there are so many IBM PCs and and those kind of systems in Delaware, that I must have a stack of them, you know, as, as tall as I am. They were free essentially, so a lot of people. Although they didn't necessarily start using computers um, themselves in Delaware, other than at the University of Delaware, which did have a strong computer science department, the seeds of the, just the pure uh, volume of computing that would be available were, was happening in Delaware at that time. Okay, so 1978, I thought I'd, I'd dig up a, an interesting computer company. How many of you have heard of Zitan, or, or X-I-T-A-N, however you want to pronounce that, a New Jersey company? They almost made it nationally, uh, but this is definitely a New Jersey homebrew or home 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 team company who made an excellent computer system. Um, and I just thought I'd illustrate that there were companies who were trying to to launch and make something happen in New Jersey. And this is one of the premier companies from New Jersey from that mid uh, to late uh, uh, S100 world. Uh, you can see in '78 you have uh, new members wanting to jump in with working systems, um, package software. More special SIGs or special interest groups were forming um, to, uh, uh, I have a computer, now what do I do with it? These were not people who wanted to take it apart and learn about it. They wanted to be told, you know, where do I get software? How do I use my computer system? Uh, PC78, which was in Atlantic City, moves to the Philadelphia uh, Civic Center. It needed a bigger venue. Um, the first PAX music show. One of the things that uh, was, was a a uh, relatively strong uh, component to uh, computing and homebrew computing in, uh, in, in our area was music 
computer music festivals, which is something you don't really know about, but PAX was, with Philadelphia Area Computer Society, was one of the first uh, uh, groups to, to focus specifically on music. And um, there were a number of, of, of interesting uh, achievements, and, and uh, those, those certainly would have been interesting performances. Computer music, what I mean by that, isn't necessarily just 8-bit music, but concepts such as randomness put it into computers. The, the concept of, of atonality, the ability to um, l allow the computer to set scales and do calculations and things that wouldn't, wouldn't be possible because instruments uh, were fixed to the 12-note scale. So computers were opening up new types of music that weren't possible. started in the 60s, but now by, by 1978, Philadelphia had very much embraced the music concept and the computer music concept. And I, I don't know if anybody here had actually been to any of those shows, but I certainly would have liked to have been there, being a musician myself. Uh, just another uh, point that I thought was interesting, the size of the U.S. market in 1978 for, uh, for, this, for the microcomputer small business, uh, very small business computer market, 180,000 to 250,000 units, depending on which magazine or source that you read. So we're not talking about a very large uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, volume. Uh, 15,000 pets were sold, between 8 to 20,000 TRS-80s, between 13 and 27,000 Apple II. So by 
build up in a huge society, our next to be one of 400 members. And so the reason I'm talking about saying that is uh, it still wasn't a huge group. We're not talking about massive uh, collections of people. Uh, but yet, yeah, they build up the computer show and they have 4,000 people. So the difference between the first print computer festival and those computer shows where you get one where they uh, uh, plug into the computer. So it's certainly still a growing group. As the types of computers um, um, that became available change, the number of people who aren't in the computer show are increasing, and that's why we have 4,000 people in the computer show. Uh, and I, I just have this list of uh, persons that uh, showed up uh, to be speaking, so it's definitely still uh, the president of the Commodore um, is actually at the Philadelphia Computer Show. The IBM PC and Osborne Convertibles were announced at these shows in addition to other shows. PC and new software packages raised special interest groups immediately and formed after the IBM PC events. So these shows and the clubs and organizers were still important. It's just that they became bigger scale. The second and final Philadelphia area computer computer show features. So already um, these were emerging into uh, there's just too many other other places that you can go. You have to wait a whole year to buy a computer these days or find out what was happening, you can just get to go to the Clipper or magazine, you can just go to the stores that I uh, showed in earlier slide. So, Philadelphia Computer Computer Society, and what eventually um, became what was the trademark of the Trek Computer Festival, were the, uh, the flea markets. And in the case of Philadelphia Area Computer Society, it's called the Ham and Chips Flea Market. Um, Commodore 64 came out of the flea market, after Lisa came out of the flea market, and Franklin Ace, which is And of course, the new class of computers, laptops, opening again the market to new, uh, new types of computers. You can see the great compass, the Franklin Ace, and the Pentium 380 model, the Hummer, the Apple Lisa, and the Commodore 64. So, in, in, in the span of seven years, eight years, we went for a computer that was a computer that was only available to those who could build it themselves from the chip, to a computer that was shown in the mailbox. And then at Macy's or Casey Fender or Macy's uh, and Sears and so on, in a box that looked like this, uh, you know, market was being run this way. So a handful of people. Was, was the Apple Lisa still part of the homebrew spirit? My answer is no. At this point, the, there's nothing wrong with printing a computer. Um, the middle end of that computer is not in the system, but it does bring the home brew spirit. It isn't that people stop. Going to clubs and going to gym, it was just that there was more going on. And the golden era, so to speak, of computers could be bookmarked in that kind of machine uh, in products like the Apple Lisa and the Commodore 64. And uh, this is my data from Fox News. The 68,000 machines uh, from the first of May 2011 were packed by source. Much, much different types of operators, much different types of uh, reliability and storage. That's the end of my talk, but I certainly don't want to change over.